Welcome, everyone. My name is Alex Goldman, and I am the editor of Connectivity Business News, which is part of Royal Media, which also publishes Cargo Facts and Air Cargo World. Thank you for joining us today for this new webinar in the, the, in the GVF webinar series in association with Connectivity Business News. Uh, with that, we will go over to our panelists. I will ask each of them to introduce themselves and also talk a little bit about their company because we have a diverse group of viewers today, starting with Will. Yeah, hey, good morning, Alex. Thanks for the introduction there. So I am Will Mudge. I'm with Speedcast, the Vice President of Engineering, as it says there on the screen. So I, uh, we have a, a team of about 150 engineers globally uh, in almost every country in the world uh, that supports all of our customers, uh, quite a diverse customer base, and we are a managed service provider. So as it pertains to things like um, mobile site tracking, container ships, the total managed uh, communications architecture and getting data back uh, for our customers. Thank you, Will. Uh, Henning? Yeah, hi, my name is Henning Podrast. Um, I'm working for Helmer Worldwide Logistics. Um, I'm heading the team for Smart Solutions. Um, we as Helmer, we are classic forwarder with a history of 150 years, still family owned. Uh, with a global network and we are in classic forwarding for everything when it comes to transportation, warehousing and value added services. And great. And Marco? Hi, my name is uh, Marco Camporeale, head of digital Immersat. Immersat is a company that uh, for the last 40 years has been defining uh, connectivity at sea to ships. Now uh, we are in the element of that accelerated in transition to a safer and more sustainable shipping. And we do that by building the, uh, the, the technology, the platform, the infrastructure, IoT and connectivity infrastructure that is required to actually win the most challenging use cases uh, on digitalization ships, where it was uh, remote survey, piloting, wealth management, et cetera. And we do that by connecting application providers and ship owners on our platforms. Great, and then Shai. Hello, good morning everybody from uh, Colorado. Uh, my name is Shai Harnoy and I lead our aviation business at Spire. Uh, Spire owns and operate, builds, owns and operates a constellation of 110 to 120 satellites that are orbiting around the globe every 90 minutes in low earth orbit. And we launch new satellites every quarter. And what they do is they measure AIS transponders we measure ADSB, so the locations of all aircraft, all ships, as well as are able to tr to uh, track and uh, forecast uh, weather conditions around the world. And so, glad to have the conversation here today. Thank you. Great. Thank you all. Um, so today's topic: we are discussing discussing communications on the move, um, a particularly hot topic with the supply chain. We brought together a mix of executives from satellite communications and transportation. And I'd like to jump right into it, starting with Henning. Uh, when we think of, of freight forwarding, um, we think of, of cargo, but we don't always think of data. So why is data important in cargo? How do you help customers achieve their goals, both as institutions and as individual employees. Um, thanks for asking, Alex. So looking back in, back in the history, I mean, from the old days, it was normal to move cargo from A to B and everyone was happy in the supply chain. Suddenly the products arrived at a certain location, uh, but it turns out, um, well, it turns out, but it, uh, due to the development in the market that everyone is used to getting real-time information about where's the product uh, is kind of uh, the customer expectations. That, that we need to deliver on-time information about where the condition or where the product is located, as well as what is the condition in the supply chain of the certain product. So therefore, uh, it's for us, kind of normal that we need to provide this data beyond classic transportation service. So it's a completely additional stream that, that, that we developed within Hellman here um, under the smart solution um, um, umbrella. And, and there we offer this additional services for the customer beyond the shipping. In order to achieve this, that's one thing for the customer. The other thing is to um, offer this also to, your, to our own employees 
to operate more efficient in the supply chain uh, instead of calling someone or um, guessing where information are. We need to have for our own operations all the information on hand to be always able to provide customers at the end of the day um, the right information at the right time. And, and so we, we can benefit from both sides, customer sides, as well as own operation sides of having all these real-time data on, data on hand. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Henning. Uh, Shai, I know also you've built an analytics platform at Spire. Um, I think data can empower the best decision making. That's kind of the, the hypothesis and the fundamental reason why we exist is using data to make better decisions here on Earth. Data from space to make better decisions here on Earth. And what we're seeing is people in their domains are really smart. You talk to people managing their reports, they're really smart about what's going on, what's coming in and out, what's likely to come in next. In airports, same thing. Okay, that's great. How do we empower them? How do we allow them to make the best decisions possible by giving the best sources of information? And for that, it's really important to have kind of consistency um, and make it really accessible. So if you throw, we collect hundreds of millions of data points every day. Every single data point. We rarely get a phone call. Hey, data point 6,832 is off. That doesn't happen, right? And so it's really important to map the data to what the use case is. How do you simplify it such that people are able to get that insight, not just shoving more data down their throats, but rather allowing them to gain meaningful insights from it? So that's fundamental to what we do and what I spend my life uh, thinking about. Okay, and I'd like to move on to uh, how has COVID changed the business? Uh, perhaps, uh, Will, we could start with you. Uh, as a managed service provider, I know you're, you're interacting with, with customers uh, up and down their, their business. Yeah, it's been very interesting to see, um, you know, as it pertains to this topic, I think we've seen a couple of different things. We're seeing ships start to stack at the ports for containers. Uh, we're seeing um, maybe an inability to interact face-to-face, -face, so an increased demand for data as we go through it. So everybody wants to know where their containers are at. They want to be able to talk to their families. So we're really seeing quite a bit of growth in a lot of these areas to be able to get this data back, as well as, and I think Shay kind of said it maybe in a different way, but getting the right data back, right? You could bring millions of data points back, but do you need millions of data points, right? Satellite bandwidth is still at a limited capacity compared to what we're used to at our home network. So being able to process that data on the edge and bring back what's important and then keep what, what you need there and go back and look at it later, I think has been really useful at the end of the day. So from our side, I think we're seeing a lot of growth, a lot more focus on it, a lot more need to track and a lot more need to be, I guess, crystal clear about what people want to see. I need to know where my container is. Maybe I need to know the temperature in it, but more importantly, when is it going to be at the port because it's late? And and Marco, if you'd like to address either of those two, I think uh, Inmarsat has also been working closely with, with smart shipping and, and smart aircraft. I, I think that, uh, you know, uh, addressing the, 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 the question of what what has changed with COVID, how, how COVID has been impacting the, the, the business. So I think in multiple ways, but the, 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 one of the most important thing is that some of the use cases that up to a couple of years ago were, were unthinkable now are reality. And I'm thinking about uh, uh, you know, uh, remote piloting of, of ships. I'm talking about, uh, uh, for instance, the, the, the Finnish Port Authority, they are all collecting data for, or, you know, for all ports into a platform of a practically a startup called, for instance, Awake AI. And all of data from all Finnish ports are all into, into one, one portal and one, one database, one platform. We are talking about uh, uh, remote uh, uh, surveys. We, we have seen an acceleration on every aspect of, uh, not only of, the, of the, 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 the shipping itself, but actually of the entire, uh, let's say, supply chain for shipping, which has, again, uh, uh, solved the, uh, element of transparency that is solving element of transparency, but also has reduced, for instance, the, the, the carbon footprint. So the, the industry has really uh, uh, had a, a kick out of uh, COVID, mainly to solve, first of all, you know, operational challenges, the fact that we could not get, kind of get on board on the ships. 
And uh, we have a re representative of a Leo system in Spire and Geo system in Inmarsat. So I'll stick. I'll stay with you, Marco, for for a moment. Uh, what does each type of system bring that the other system does not? Are they complementary or competitive? So when when we talk about uh, you know LEO system, EO system, uh, they are complementary. So he, already with with Imarsat, uh, we had this uh, uh, network or network called the orchestra that we are bringing to reality, where we put together uh, terrestrial uh, connectivity LTE with LEO and GEO. I think are very complementary. There are different use cases that we can solve, that we can help from the you know, IoT uh, in remote places all the way to you know, uh, uh, remote uh, uh, and autonomous vehicles. And when those technology uh, work together, they really uh, solve uh, e e perfectly uh, some of those uh, use cases on technology, yes. And Shai, your opinion? Um, so, I mean, plus one to what Marco said, it's not about the satellite, it's about what you do with them. So if you're looking for global connectivity, then having something in geostationary orbit with a constant footprint might make sense for a bunch of applications for consistent coverage. Um, if you're looking for low latency, um, low latency or detection of certain objects, or you want to be able to innovate in space, um, low Earth orbit might be more accessible. So we launch a handful of satellites every single quarter. The most one of the most exciting places at Spire is the launch channel on our Slack because there's always something going on. A new contract, a new launch, uh, 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 or some new activity going on with our upgrades in space. And that's fundamental to what we're trying to do. Now, mind you, we're not off off offering communication payloads. So we're sensing ADSB, we're sensing weather, we're doing some custom payloads for folks um, and are able to get into space within six months from contract signature. And so that's kind of part of the DNA of the company that Leo allows, whereas Geo and the allocation of FCC spectrum and, and a lot of the traditional uh, approaches might, might, might hamper it. Um, but it's really about starting from the use case and then walking back to what do we need? Maybe a tower on the ground uh, or crowdsourced networks of cell phones is, 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 more, is more productive for that application. Um, but yeah, so absolutely complimentary, but start with the use case is really where, where the magic happens. Okay, and we have our, our first question from, from the audience. Uh, I think I'll direct to start with you, Marco. Uh, are there any connectivity differences between how service providers interface and or support the air versus maritime? Then I wanna to go to Henning. There are differences. Again, it's, it's, it's all about the application. There are differences on how uh, we support the different, uh, uh, the, the, the different application. There are differences with maritime, there are differences on, uh, on uh, you know between the vessels and 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 uh, uh, the antennas and how they communicate. Uh, I know there are differences also inside the vertical. So even if you go in maritime, it's very different from how a fishing vessel uh, wants to connect compared to a cruise ship and and uh, and uh, and the anchor landing vessel or, or a tanker. So there are, the applications are different. The service are different. And again, there might be as you know depending on the application, even if the application is merely communication, uh, different application might require actually different services, even different uh, constellation of satellites. Right, so that's if you're providing the actual connectivity. Henning, from your perspective, is there less of a difference? Uh, I would say there's a huge difference. Uh, and, and when I heard to what, what Che is saying and Marco, um, both sides from my screen right now, it's very interesting because like I'm, I'm in the, in the round here, more or less the consumer, because I use this data that are provided from the satellites in order to embed it in, in the platform that we offer to the customer. And talking about customer, at the end of the day, these are the persons who have a use case out of it. And um, the use cases are totally different, talking with a customer that is sending or with us containers and where we track containers on a sea freight um, basis, um, there's, another requirement when it comes to um, ping rate, so communication rate. I need to know it only a couple of hours where the location of a ship is located because it's not moving that much. Totally different use case. Talking with an, with an air freight customer, I don't want to say it's their expectation that they have every minute in new information where, where the shipment is located or the plane is located. But from a logistic point of view, if I know every minute that there's a delay 
for example, that the, there's a, a transshipment in, 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 in between in the supply chain. I know due to the fact that the plane is late, I have this information every minute, and I can calculate directly based on um, AI that it will not make the transshipment, the logistics shipment. So I can inform the customer right away, okay, guys, um, there's a delay. So therefore there is a big difference in, in use cases, talking about air freight or sea freight on the other side, um, from the customer who's sitting in front of the computer and use the system on a day-to-day -day in order to optimize the supply chain. Understood. Um, Shay, Shay, you wanted to say something? Well, I have a question for Marco and Henning. Um, so it used to be for connectivity solutions in remote areas, whether it's aircraft or maritime, it used to be, it was all about dollars per, per gigabit per second. How fast can you give it? How cheap can you do it? Does it change? Everything I Henning just said was talking about the data, right? About just the, the, the connectivity. Have things changed? Are people's expectations different? Because they want to be able to do a Zoom chat with their families when they're at sea. Like, what are we seeing as far as the trends? You, you laugh, but that's probably actually true. Most of the people on board vessels want to Zoom for their kids, uh, you know, uh, for their kids play. So what are you seeing there? Only looking for the, if it's okay, Marco, I would, um, only looking from the logistic perspective, it changed totally. I mean, when I, when I started like about like eight years ago, building up the smart solutions within Helma, it was like, yeah, you know, um, there are some customers who are interested in it. And um, also based on the question from Alex, in the last two years, a little bit more than two years, do we snowballed the, the requirement from the customer that they're actively looking for this solution? And because and, uh, their private behavior of Zoom conferences, they are a lot more connected and, and therefore they expect the same in their, in their uh, way of how they handle their business. So um, that's just, um, yeah, it's the same in your private, in, in your private um, um, connection. You have the same expectation business-wise. So therefore we need to, to offer this as an, or we're we offering this as a standard service here. If I may uh, add the comment, uh, ask, uh, reply direct, directly, Shai. So, uh, he, and I'm looking at, uh, I'm talking about maritime business. Depending on, on the verticals, practically, the, the main reason why a, a ship needs connectivity is for crew effort, to allow the crew to you know, be able to navigate on the internet, connect with their beloved, and et cetera. So, and uh, again, COVID has <laughs> accelerated that because uh, more and more of, of ships, uh, because of the tragedy of many of uh, the, uh, our crews actually being on the ships and not be able to, to, to be back on land, uh, the you know, ship managers have stepped up and actually increased the level of uh, connectivity provided to the ship. At the same time, uh, this, uh, you know, I'm trying to use, a, I will use a, one of these buzzwords, the IoT, uh, uh, type of uh, uh, digital solution where we require more of the tracking of the assets, tracking of the equipment on board, tracking and, and management of uh, the, the, the live stream of data coming from all the sensors on board of those assets uh, as becoming more and more uh, a, 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 a core element, a core request of uh, our customer, of our, you know, the ship energy and ship owners. Way on one side because of uh, uh, the target of uh, decarbonization and you know the requirement of the International Maritime Organization to reduce uh, the carbon footprint of the entire shipping uh, as a as a as a supply chain, but we see more and more uh, uh, together with the, an increasing requirement of a level of a basic level of communication to allow the crew to be able to you know use uh, on one side. Uh, uh, they, 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 you know, TikTok and on the other side, you know, WhatsApp to talk with the family. At the same time, we see that uh, uh, IoT platform, get, you know, getting on board the ship, collecting as many data as possible, bring them on shore and uh, uh, perform analytics of those data in order to improve the performances, whether from the basic of, uh, uh, you know, adjusting the, the, the ship uh, uh, speed in order to get uh, just in time instead of uh, rushing and then consuming and then uh, 
and then uh, uh, leave, uh, stay at the anchor waiting at the port. So there is a lot that can be done with the data. There is a treasure, there is a, a data today in, in the maritime business at the, new, at the new goal, because there is a lot of optimization that, that is lying in the data if we are willing to uh, take the, do the job to extract the data and collect them and, do, and, and analyze them. I want to move on to what happens when, when things go wrong. We have a question from the audience, but I want to start with you, Will, with just the basic question of security risks. You, met, you mentioned that you're a managed service provider. Um, to what extent is your customer's risk your responsibility? And to, to uh, what extent uh, do you expect them to bring a certain level of expertise? And has all these trends that we're talking about changed the sort of services that you have to bring in a managed service provider? Yeah, there's, there's a couple of parts to that question. So if I, if I miss one, let me make sure you remind me so we can circle back to it. Um, certainly these day and times, especially the more recent last 30 day times with our political environments, we've seen an increase of risk from a cybersecurity perspective. And, you know, it's an interesting question. What's, what's our piece of that versus what's our customers. And, you know, I hate, I hate uh, black and white. I think honestly, it depends a lot, right? It depends on our customers. It depends on their type of traffic and what they want. When you're talking a crew welfare service, like Marco was referring to, oftentimes it's just internet access. And there are ways we provide protection across internet access, um, but you have to work with the providers or, you know, your customers to make sure they understand what that is. Some customers are more mature, in that journey, when you look at you know big corporations, they tend to have their own policies and things like that that we need to work with and make sure their networks are designed around. When you work with smaller customers, you know that that don't have big IT groups, they may be less educated, and you need to help bring them along. So, oftentimes, we spend a lot of time in education more than anything else. We have our standards that we adhere to. We we help our customers through those processes to be there, but we also work with them to make sure that whatever things they have in place from a corporate perspective, we're adhering to and, and working through that as well. So there's, there's quite a bit to that question. I think the advice from my side for the audience would be, it is a new world. We're seeing increased risks. You absolutely have to have that conversation with your providers to make sure that you're getting the safety that you need on the net. Even basic internet connections are so dangerous right now if you don't restrict parts of restricted down and you, and you need to have those things in place um, to make sure you do. And, and Will, is, is that a specific skill set do you, that you hire to, or do you expect all of your security experts to be able to communicate with customers? Uh, uh, sorry, the, the education of your customers, is that a skill set you hire to? It's, it's hard to hire to it. I think it, it takes a certain type of engineer to make the complex simple right, in many cases, and have an easy conversation and say, look, this is, we need to do this really technical thing, and that means this, right, and make it so people understand what that means to them on a day-to-day -day basis, because you don't, you're not talking necessarily from an IT expert or cybersecurity expert to somebody that understands the same language, right, when we talk about tagging packets, you know, most people it just goes over their head in some cases, so you have to find that, that ability to do it. Do we hire specifically for that? No. I think we try to train our people on how to do it. We help our customers understand the standards. Um, we help our sales team understand what that is because they have that technical bridge, right? They, they have enough engineering knowledge that they can understand what we're telling them. And then they know how to talk to customers in many cases. So I think we have that within the business and it, it is a hard thing to find. Okay, and then I'd like to go to another audience question. I think I'll start, start with Henning. Um, how disruptive is it when sudden circumstances occur that are de detrimental to supply chain? And how difficult is it to report trends in real time? Or I would add, um, what happens if you don't have real time information? So the, the first impact that you notice immediately is that you lose customers. So simple it is. Uh, simple question, simple answer. So you would lose customers because the customer expectation is, as I just mentioned before, you need to have this in place. And, and this comes a little bit, uh, I don't know if it's like disruptive at the end of the day, but, but at least, I mean, uh, 
you are a little bit before the customer expects to have this kind of service in place. Um, that, that's the minimum, I would say, the minimum requirement to have their certain features because it's a little bit more beyond just tracking information. Um, there's, there's a combination of different sources that you bundle together. And uh, if you cannot provide um, these kind of combined services, then it will be disruptive for your industry. Because um, as soon as someone is, is providing you um, or another competitor provides just pure information, it can, it can uh, be pretty hard uh, in the logistic industry because then you are only the, the person of the company who moves goods from A to B. So you need to have this in place um, as an additional service. Um, what was the other part of the question? Yeah. Um, so, so how disruptive is it to your business? And then how difficult is it to report trends in real time when disruptions happen? I guess we're thinking of yeah. vessels. Sit yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So, so at the end, at the end of the day, it is it is right now with like this eight years of experience, it's not that complicated anymore to to report this because it's 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 part of, of the product portfolio. But when we started it, it was it was really hard to get all the informations together. And as Shay said this at the beginning, it's not that we show just data points because data points the customer don't care about data points. They want to see a, on a, on a, on a web interface a journey of a vessel, of a plane, of a truck like transport mode, they want to see where it is and they don't care about a single data point. So that's that's a uh, key essential here to put this on a, on a user um, face together that's easy to handle for them. And then it, it, uh, it will be not disruptive for us. Okay. With respect to the sudden circumstances, what's interesting is that there's always a sudden circumstance somewhere around the globe, unfortunately, right? It may not make the, the, the international news, but there's always a disruption, whether it's in Long Beach, the Suez Canal, these are the big ones, but there's all the time something going on. Okay, cool. There might be a volcano erupting, you know, uh, grounding air traffic, or what we're seeing, unfortunately, right now in Eastern yeah. Europe, there's obviously adjusting things. Um, do, do, you, do you have an example of a smaller one that you might have experienced that wasn't widely reported? No. FBOs for business aviation. Uh, where the airport goes to lunch. The control tower goes to lunch. <laughs> like, I'm not even exaggerating, right? Like during COVID, they're like, hey, there's not much traffic. It's lunchtime. Let's go grab a burger. Um, right? So you're, you can constantly evaluate uh, somewhere throughout your network what the downstream effects are. And what Henning was talking about is that there's always been regional data. There's always been local data. There's always been that, that person there looking out of their office that can see how many, how many, how many ships are, 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 are anchored off, uh, off port. Okay, cool. But how do you gather that in one place to allow these insights to happen? So this question is spot on, right? How difficult is it to report trends in real time? I'm, I, would, I would pose that with global, uh, global data, with consistent coverage around the world, without dark spots in certain parts of the world, Historically, in like China and Africa and Russia, you see dark spots or over some, some parts of the ocean, but really kind of a consistent grid around the globe. Like you're able to, to pick these things out in real time. And that's pretty powerful. And I'm obviously, you can see, I'm pretty geeked out about it, uh, just coming from a data background. Um, I'd like to, to move on. Another audience question. Actually, this one seems to have been directed, especially to Marco. Um, Ocean going vessels are consuming up to 150 to two gigabits average monthly. Um, will we see even more with the internet of things? Um, I think also I've heard that the internet of things uh, drives different requirements. Uh, Multi-threading, the ability to handle a large number of simultaneous streams. So uh, we have seen that uh, from January 20, 20 to March 2021. I, I saw the question, so I, I just reading straight the data. From January 2020 to March 2021, we were reporting as average daily, daily consumption, a jump from 3.4 gigabyte per day in January 20 to 9.8 gigabyte per day in March 21. So 10 gigabyte per day in March 21. Okay, so very, very, you know, the anonymous certainly here is, is spot on, as average. Uh, this was January 21. 
So I will say that uh, you know this trend has not stopped. So we might be seeing, uh, I don't have the latest data, but we might be seeing the 20, 25, 30 gigabyte per day as average on a ship today. But I'm very happy to go and, uh, and check the latest data and, and, and reply maybe offline. Great. When it comes to the IoT, it's, very, it's also a very interesting point because uh, uh, you want today to distinguish, uh, already today on a ship, you want to distinguish the network uh, uh, dedicated for the crew, the network dedicated to the corporate operation, you know, the computer of the captain with the, with the navigation, and uh, the operation technology network with, uh, you know, all of the sensors and, and, and the engine and all of the, the equipment. And when it comes to IoT, you want to make sure that uh, uh, what we do, for instance, in Imarsat is having a dedicated bandwidth, a dedicated synthetic virtual network just for the IoT data in order to get uh, you know, a, a level of cybersecurity, a uh, higher level of cybersecurity. You are never you know, cyber secure uh, by definition, a higher level of cybersecurity by completely separating the IoT data in a different, uh, in, in a separate, a dedicated bandwidth to ensure that the data are continuously you know, streaming and they are separated by, for instance, the queue, the queue networking. So and, definitely and, a different level of, uh, of data. In terms of quantity, uh, well, I still believe that you know, streaming, uh, streaming a YouTube video is still a, a, a lot of bandwidth compared to uh, an engine uh, uh, data stream, but uh, uh, the IoT uh, is uh, growing exponentially. And Marco, let me let me add here, uh, especially if the, uh, as I noticed that there are more and more containers equipped with the with tracking devices. Also, there customers want that they, these devices are also communicating when the shipment, when the container is on the ocean, and uh, I mean we can track it at least on location wise. But the expectation gets more and more to the point. Hey, I would like to have the temperature information even if it's in the middle of the Atlantic. So please make it happen. Very Absolutely. simple. So therefore, Absolutely. this will grow to the roof, definitely. Yeah, I think we are uh, we are working uh, with uh, different startups and different known companies who are working on the challenge of uh, you know when you have uh, you know ten thousand containers on a ship, one stack over the other. It's actually <laughs> a challenge to get data from that container on a Wi-Fi or anything because there is a lot of steel. But uh, we are working with those companies exactly to get uh, the huge amount of data that containers actually might have uh, to onboard the ship and then into a pipe off in order to be able to add that element of seamless tracking uh, of a container from a truck to a ship and then to a truck again and get it. So working on that is, is an interesting challenge. Yeah, I think well, definitely one of the next innovations. And I think today, just to summarize too, we see an increase in data almost exponentially, right? If you're seeing, you're always going to see a growth in that. People just want more data, regardless of if it's for tracking or for crew welfare, or for face timing. Uh, I mean, for us, for the data, the trends that we see, it's almost doubling year over year in many cases. And I, I'd like to move on to violations of data norms and start with, with Shai. Um, uh, it can be as simple as turning off a transponder, but on this topic, what, what, what do you do when you're tracking a ship and you just lose track of it? I would say it's really indicative if the transponder is turned off. Like that is a meaningful source of information uh, when it goes off. And uh, a lot of the customers we work with in, in, for defense applications, for illegal fishing, for border patrol, et cetera, they don't care about the flow of traffic that necessarily. They care about anomalies in the flow of traffic. And so we work with partners around the world that are uh, using other sensors. And that's actually a really key indicator to go follow up on it on the AIS side. Um, ADSB as well, right, on, 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 on aircraft. And sometimes it's because of GPS jamming, right, which happens in certain parts of the world. Um, and that has impacts on flight safety, on, on navigations, on controls, on a lot of other downstream effects. And so uh, how do you handle violations of data norms? I think um, uh, we pay very close attention to them. And oftentimes some of the most interesting bits of insight happen when there are these violations. And is that humans or artificial intelligence? 
So AI picks it out, but humans figure out why it might happen. So I, so I have a PhD in this stuff in like AI, and I still don't think AI or our robot overlords are going to make all their decisions for us. I think they're going to dramatically enhance our ability to make decisions, to point to us to anomalies and allow us to use our context, our intuition, and our past experience in order to make better decisions around it. And so human in the loop every day of the week, uh, totally automated, fire and forget, push button, go get a drink, go get a, a coffee. Um, depends on what time of the world, sometimes 5 p.m. And so it's a different type of drink. Um, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm much more skeptical about that. And Marco, I'd like to put a little bit of a more complex question to you, which is, uh, is data from IoT standardized? Do you have to work to put the various streams together? So uh, the standards uh, do exist. We have different types of standards. And uh, IMO, the, the International Maritime Organization, is also working to, to, to uh, let's say, set advice on the standards, but they are, they are not imposing standards yet. The challenge is that since uh, those standards are not uh, imposed and are, they are not industry standards that are uh, computer, you know, fully recognized, there is a still a, uh, especially on board the ship between, you know, equipment, the, the equipment is still working as a silo. So you might get on board the ship and it's, uh, you know, we have light years away from uh, what we can find, uh, you know, on an airplane or what we can find uh, on, on, on a car where all the equipment is uh, using, you know, a, a CAN bus and exchanging data and there is, uh, you know, a central processing unit collecting all the data. On a ship, every ship is an island. Every ship has a different design, even sister ships. Every system on board the ship is an island. You have, uh, you know, an engine control unit and a thruster control unit and, and you know, a, a battery system. Every single uh, or equipment structure is using, is collecting the data they want, the day, in the way they want. And they are not, they don't need to share it. So there is no agreed standard interface. So one of the challenges of collecting data on board the ship is actually every single ship is a bespoke project of integration and data collection in interfaces. And it's a, and it's a very interesting challenge. So yeah, there are standards, but very few are actually using this standard and even less are actually willing to share unless the owner, the customers, the people with the money demand it. And I'd like to move on to Henning because I gather you're also, as a freight forwarder, you're working with an airport, you're working with an airline, you're working with a trucking company, you're, you're working with a variety of different systems. I imagine you get non-standard data as well. Yeah, it comes by the by the nature of logistic providers. So, um, as you, when you work with a lot of partners together, um, that's that's a classic history, like having different data silos, and and here's the big challenge to get uh, to connect them together. And uh, a little bit like Marco said, every every ship, it's the same with every um, uh, branch. Every partner is an individual um, silo. And, and they're the, the big competitions to get this data together. Um, we manage it most of the times, of course, but um, getting this, again, looking always from the customer perspective, um, providing there for the customer at the end of the day, uh, something where they can work with um, is, is for sure the most challenging part, only speaking. Um, but it, it looks like that, that the entire industry logistic wise is moving in the right direction and to offer their certain um, levels of transparency for the customers in order to, to um, yeah, um, have their convenient way of, of, um, of working together and, and showing them, okay, here's all your data combined together on one platform without jumping from one data field to the next one and um, try to find out what, what does data field mean. So here's a question that just occurred to me, Henning, would you ever choose a route based on the quality of data you could provide as opposed to speed and efficiency and other kinds of efficiency? 
at the end of the day, you have to ask customer what they want. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's the same with a question like, okay, are you using the cheapest carrier or are you going with the highest quality? So it really depends on nowadays, I would personally go on the best quality because uh, I think everyone knows that logistic wise, every supply chain is a little bit bumpy right now due to certain reasons. If it was COVID, if it was a Zeus canal, then there's um, um, the war right now. So um, I personally would go on the quality side here. Um, and, and quality means also quality of data um, in, in order to to, to um, put there the right strings together and, and have enough information to make correct decisions at the end of the day, um, especially when we're looking on supply chains where we talk about just in sequence, um, you need to rely on the data at the end of the day because otherwise your entire production uh, stands still. Well, you can imagine the risk, right? Basically, it's like if there's a black hole of data, like that's increased risk around that path. And sometimes I might tolerate more risk and other times I really care about it. Uh, I'm, I'm less, um, I'm more risk averse, right? Um, uh, correct. And uh, so uh, we also have a question here about uh, maybe satellite we think of as ubiquitous, but maybe it isn't available anywhere, uh, e everywhere. Um, what do you do about holes in satellite coverage? Maybe you don't have landing rights. Maybe there are other issues. Uh, Shai? Yeah, so I mean, one of the things that's, that I'm proud of on satellites is that they don't care about your borders. And they're constantly orbiting the globe, whipping around the globe at 13,000 miles an hour. It's about 20,000 kilometers an hour, wrapping around the globe every 90 minutes. Uh, political borders don't mean anything. However, what you, you mentioned landing rights, and that is a big deal, especially on the communication side, where great, the satellite knows about stuff going on, but how do, you, how do you tell the rest of the world? You need to be able to downlink that information. And so our newest satellite, satellites that are launching have uh, what we call inter-satellite communication. So as I'm flying over, over an area, even if I don't have landing rights there, um, I can pass that information to another satellite that's heading towards the ground station that we will. Um, and this way we're able to reduce our latency. Whereas in the past, you might've had to store and forward like, oh, I saw an aircraft over this country where, where, um, um, uh, where there might be, a, you know, communication uh, uh, restrictions. And so, or I just don't have a ground station in, let me wait until I get over a more friendly place or where I do have a ground station. Uh, I think the geo folks have, have a different, uh, uh, probably a much different response, but that's how we think about it as far as, as we're whipping around the globe, being able to reduce that latency and make sure there are no, no dead spots. And I apologize, okay, Alex, but maybe I can build on this one and from the last one too, right? I think you know, choosing a route is kind of tied to the same question about these, these shadow spots here, where you have capacity, where you don't. And I think we're seeing increasingly, like with the Leos, you're not running into many of these shadow locations. But Shai, I think what we're talking about is in some countries, in Indonesia and Malaysia, as an example, you have to have land the traffic that's generated in the country in the country, right? So even if you have inter-satellite links, you're still gonna have to pull it down or from a stored forward perspective. So there's still challenges there, which goes back to how to work with you know, the right provider to so make sure that you're getting the full coverage in those areas. But I think from a globalization perspective, right? I know this has been kind of a keyword lately with what's again the political climate going on. I think from a satellite globalization and LEOs and what they're bringing, we're starting to see that kind of go away. So there's very few, shadow areas you know remaining i think there's a lot of opportunities and ways you may have to go through different systems but end of the day there's really not a spot on the globe you can't cover anymore right it's just which system do you need to use to get to that spot shy's example for spire is, is great right it's a, it's a leo one you don't have to have wi-fi or lobra or lte coverage to get iot data you go to a leo sat right and you may not have it as real time but that's okay. You're still getting data out of some of these locations and not everything has to be real time. You're not tracking the ship every single second of the day, right? You're hitting it every few minutes. So, so well, what you're saying is that rather than coverage, the concern is increasing data sovereignty rules. If you have data about our citizens, it has to pass through our country. It can't go through other countries. Yeah. I, I don't know if I'd call data sovereignty as much as regulatory rules in it, but I think it ties together. It's the same thing, right? AIS data 
you know, do the data sovereignty rules apply for lawful intercept on sovereign on AIS plane position data? I really doubt it, but I don't think they're going to catch up to this pace or say, oh, okay, well, that data is fine. We don't have to do that one. You know, they're just going to keep the general rules and these countries tend to move a lot slower. So, but the fact that we're seeing Leo starting to get into these places means you can land it in and get it out faster. Great. And Marco, I think the, there's an opportunity for you to provide the geo perspective. Well, uh, it's, it's not, uh, it's not a, again, a challenge of, of technology because uh, especially with Imarsat, our, uh, the, our coverage is global, uh, apart maybe some, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, penguins in the, in the South Pole and uh, not, not, not more the polar bears in the North because we are launching now also a uh, uh, highly elliptical orbit satellite covering the, the poles. So, so there will, will be even more uh, uh, global coverage. So the, the, the challenge is, again, is regulatory. Uh, there are nations where, you know, some frequencies are not, are not allowed. But then again, uh, we build, uh, we are building a, an infrastructure, a network or network, the orchestra, where we will also be uh, using other technologies like Leo with other frequency, but also uh, terrestrial with other frequency. So uh, the challenge of uh, you know dark spot, uh, it, 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 it is uh, something that we can definitely win. I'd like to, to move on to Henning. Uh, the logistics void, one of the data challenges isn't just blank spots, it's what happens when your cargo moves from a ship to a truck to a plane. You've got several handoffs right after each other. Uh, is that a particular challenge for you? It was in the past more than right now, are we speaking, because we managed to bundle these data together. Um, so you have on the one side, you have an IoT device in the container or in the truck or whatever. Uh, and, and you need to bundle this together with a relevant ship or relevant air, um, air um, a plane. So that, that was an issue in the past. We, we solved this, luckily. Um, but talking about, I mean, um, when we talk about tracking a shipment compared to a vessel and the requirements are different because when we talk about tracking a shipment, the customer's interested in getting the data of the shipment. So with other words, temperature, humidity, light, shock, all these kind of stuff. So that's that's a little bit different from the challenge uh, of uh, not getting the data, more like presenting the data, showing the data, and hand out the customer certain um, certain ways how to deal with the data. Again, it's not single points of temperature. It's something where uh, or just one important to provide them information like thresholds, hey, you know, based on the information that the temperature is so high of this level, I would recommend to do this or that with your cargo. And so there's another challenge instead of just, okay, you're supplying, right? So um, the complexity of when you add more and more data uh, or more and more data points, um, like temperature, as I mentioned, uh, in, in the platform, the complexity is a lot higher in regards to expectations of the customer, what, what to do with the data at the end of the day, what kind of recommendations do you, you give the customer? So when you see a problem, do you want the decision to be made locally or do you have a network operations center where these sorts of alerts come in and you make the decision there? Um, of course you can do it with the control tower, very simple. Um, based on the SOPs you define with the customer, if this happens, then please uh, inform this or that location on a, on a global scale. Um, and you can set this up for every shipment on the SOPs uh, that, that, are, that are directly linked to the, um, to the shipment. That's, that's uh, most of the time the use case that we do. Um, but in order to um, have their streamlined process, we enable um, our operations people to look on the same shipment for the same customer from different angles of the world. So when it starts in Germany, where I'm from, our German operation take over first and then the shipment is moving to the US, for example, and then uh, the ops from the operations side from the US are tracking the shipment from there on because different time zones require different service levels. So SOP, standard operating procedure. So hopefully you've thought of these yes. problems before they happen. <laughs> from time to time, yes. <laughs> yeah. I think SOPs are the result of a problem solved. 
So I think it goes back to kind of what Shai was saying there too. This is where AI really helps, right? You're, you have a significant amount of data coming in and you need to look for variations in that data and then make decisions based off of that. And having a human read it is, is an imperfect system, right? You, you're never going to be able to make that successful. In long term, you're going to have to find a way to be able to process data better and understand key data. Shai, that seems like an, an opening for you. Yeah, no, so absolutely. So um, I like to say AI sounds spooky and hard, but it's statistics, right? Uh, what do they say? A uh, data scientist is a statistician who lives in San Francisco. Um, like we've been looking for anomalies in data for a long time. It doesn't have to be the most cutting edge CNNs, convolutional neural nets or deep learning in order for you to get meaningful insight. You have hundreds of millions of points coming at you. You should figure out what's going on inside of it. Even very simple rules can get you 80% of the answers. Um, and the more sophisticated you are, of course, the more you can pinpoint anomalies, the more you can come up with subtleties, the more predictive power you have. Notice I didn't say prediction. I said predictive. Uh, the two are very different. Uh, Explain. Well, being predictive means having a likelihood for something happening. So a one in 10 chance, that's actually high, but it may not happen. Right um, now, if you have cargo on a hundred aircraft every single day and you have a one in 10 chance, it'll probably happen. Uh, and as N gets big, if you want to geek out, it's called the central limit theorem. As, uh, as N gets big, the, the probability becomes the truth. Um, yeah. Now, if you're just tracking one vessel, it might be okay. Um, Right. Um, but oftentimes we're talking to operators who have a lot of interests consistently. And so these numbers do matter a lot. And Marco, I know Inmarsat has an ongoing research project about how companies are using IoT data, whether they are able to use the IoT data. If I remember correctly, one of your most recent findings was that people are collecting more data than they use. People collect. Uh... Uh, more data that they use. So, because uh, the idea is that uh, uh, we collect this data now and then uh, we will figure out later on uh, what to do with those data. And, you know, data is, is, is becoming more and more this, this, uh, this element of uh, a treasure. And uh, you want to collect all of the data that are available because the cost of collecting the data. Uh, is uh, sometimes neglectable compared to uh, the, 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 the improvement in, in efficiency that you can get out of that uh, later on. And you know, at the very beginning, you don't know, uh, uh, you know what data would you need for, for a use case. So there are very much many who actually collect data and then we say, Let, let's figure out afterwards. Still, I find that uh, the uh, personally, I find that uh, the other way around, which is define the use case, define what I want to do, and then look for the data is sometimes a, a, a better route because uh, then uh, then it gives uh, gives a, a, a specific a strategical direction of what to do, and especially when it comes to to maritime where. Uh, we can really get off the ship tons of data with frequency that are down to the millisecond, but do we actually really need all this amount of data? Uh, so very often when we engage with, with a ship owner, a ship manager who wants to start their journey of uh, digitalization and ask us, okay, what data can, can you collect? We always ask, what do you want to do? Are you looking at uh, weather routing? Are you looking at uh, uh, optimizing uh, your uh, your generators? Are you looking at uh, uh, you know uh, that or that? So is understanding the, the use case, and then we'll uh, uh, you know we usually support our customer in finding the data. But the other way around can be a very exhaustive, uh, uh, let's say, uh, journey in trying to capture as many data as possible. To do then nothing with that. But I, th I think the temptation is there because people don't always know what they can do. That's, that's also very true. The, 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 the point here is that uh, uh, there are already, and, and I'm looking at, uh, I'm talking about maritime here, uh, there are already some very interesting use cases, like again, uh, working on uh, uh, speed optimization uh, to optimize the speed of the ship in order not to, you know, 
do the rush to weight, uh, weather routing. Those are basic use cases that have demonstrated to, you know, uh, improve the bringing, you know, the 20, 25% of reduction in fuel consumption, which, you know, in, in a, it is a hundred of thousand of dollars and is hundreds of, 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 you know, of tons of reduction of CO2. Those are the use cases that still, still five out of six ships in the world are not, uh, are not working on. Uh, we, we need to remember that still uh, there are uh, very few ships who are actually uh, one out of, only one of uh, six ships uh, with the uh, IMO numbers so of big ships are actually collecting data on uh, the gigabyte I were talking, many ships are still uh, buying 200 megabyte of data per month. So I think that is uh, uh, when we're talking about data, uh, we need we really need to think that uh, you know the average ship is not collecting the 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 the, the, the 200 gigabytes. You have the you know the big container ships who are running uh, tons of. Uh, uh, data per second, and you have uh, on the other side maybe the a small fishing be vessel who is just sending emails. So that that one out of six you said big vessels is that freighters or is it also? Yeah, we are talking. I'm ships. talking. At, you know, I'm talking. Uh, let's say that 120,000 ships are uh, about registered with an IMO number. Only about 20,000, and uh, will please help me on that just to make it around. Only 20,000 have actually visa and uh, the rest are, are running on an L band. And uh, most of those are running, you know, buying anything between 50 and 300 megabyte uh, per month. Yeah, but I think, Marco, what we've seen at least is they'll put the data collection on the big ships as pilot programs and then they start rolling it out to the rest of the fleet. I think you're always going to see the segregation in fleets, like you say. You know, a container ship is always going to be a different data usage profile than a fishing vessel. But that's not to say fishing vessels don't see an increase on it too, right? They still, Absolutely. you know, daily catch limits or whatever regulatory limits they have that they have to report. We always see this data growth piece of it, and I think it it just it flows into the industry a little slower. They do a pilot program on this ship. They make sure that they like it. All the engineers geek out because of all this data they can get in the new algorithms, like Shay was talking about, that they can run. Then they say, okay, well, that's dumb. We're not going to do all the data. Let's focus on these pieces. And they refine it. And then they start rolling it out to the fleet as compared to having to do it in one large chunk. And I think that's kind of what you're describing we're seeing. We see it on the big ones. They figure it out. And then they start to push it out to the rest of the fleet. That's, that is very true. I'd like to encourage our audience to ask any questions. We're getting towards the end. Um, I'd like to run down the line, starting with Henning, on uh, to, to close by talking about the future. Uh, what data would you like to have that you do not have now? Or what data service would you like to be able to offer that you cannot offer now? Um, first of all, what, what would be the biggest challenge right now on talking it again as a logistic provider here, uh, the biggest challenge will be to give customers a real-time information about their greenhouse CO2 emissions, because this is really changing for all of us, uh, change the, the game totally. Change the game means, do we change the transport mode going from sea freight to air freight? What kind of vessel I'm using? A newer vessel on the sea freight side, same with the, with the air freight side. And we, I noticed this as we launched right now for the air freight, air system in order to give the customer the real-time CO2 information, uh, information, the greenhouse information. So therefore, the biggest challenge is they're getting more accurate data, be more specific here, because everyone is desperately looking for it. And we need to give this to our customers on hand in order to make then afterwards better decisions of, okay, do I use an old or book my shipment on an old plane or an old ship, or do I use a little bit newer one? So therefore, that's that's for all of us, I guess, one of the biggest challenge here, because um, otherwise, um, for the logistics segment, there's no way to measure the greenhouse gas specific in order to reduce it afterwards. Okay, and uh, I did ask the audience for questions. Uh, I think this one is for uh, any of the three of you. Raise your hand. Uh, do we have enough spectrum for for the the data consumption that we anticipate in the future um 
are we going what okay will so uh, i'll take that one and i think the answer is no right you know if you look at it, they're talking about growth and arrow the, the, it's not growth. I mean, those guys have been consuming a significant amount of data for a long time. I think Leo is going to be more useful in maritime than you think. Uh, I think we've just got to start getting it out and you'll, you'll see the value that it can bring and add. But the reality is, you know, even right now, we're constrained on capacity in, in some areas, especially with 5G. We've lost part of C-band. Uh, we're going to continue to lose it. It's pushing customers into KU and KA spectrums. Um, funny enough, you say... Asian users and customers, I think right now, Asia is probably where we have uh, more capacity available than, than some other regions. So that one might continue to be, you know, more available for geo type of use. But uh, I think the answer fundamentally is going to be no. I think we're seeing too much growth versus the capacity that we have. And we're already seeing some constraints in some areas. Leo's the corollary to that, will the answer ever be yes, given the current <laughs> demand? Well, it's right? a good question too. I, I don't think that answer will ever be yes. I think you're right, Shay. I think no matter how much we put in the sky, I mean, Elon continues to look at adding, you know, we've got 2,000 satellites roughly now, and he wants to get to 30,000 just to meet that demand. And that's not even enough. You still have Amazon and Telesat and OneWeb. Uh, everybody else that's going up and putting capacity and that's not even enough. So, yeah, I think you're going to continue to see it. You're, you're spot on. And, and Marco, did you want to jump in here too? Uh, yes, yes. I, I think that the, the more capacity you bring, the more will be, the will, the, it will always be filled. I mean, even, even, even at home, I mean, I, I was running a few years ago on, on a 40 megabyte, uh, uh, megabit per second. Now, and, and, and that was not enough. Now I have a fiber with 600, and that's not enough because every single of my daughter wants to stream its own, on its own pad and its own video, and, and it's never enough. So the more we give, the, the more they will require. So, which is, which is, you know, which is, which means that there is continuous, you know, technological improvement, and it's good. It is good that it, it is like this. It is, you know, as, it would be very difficult to have a, 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 a demand lower than a capacity. The capacity is there, we will use it. Great. Just along that line, I think it comes to cost though too, right? So we gotta have the cost versus the utilization right as well. And, and just quickly, Will, and any data service or data point that you'd like to provide or have that you don't know? about utilization of capacity or cost of capacity or- Or, or, or no, just uh, in, in the future, how, what, what, uh, what future development would most benefit what you do now? Um, I mean, from our perspective, it's not like in, in, in Hennings, right? Where, you know, having a reefer temperature would be useful or location of a, of a place with, with the managed service, it's more about the technologies that are enabling it. And I think what we're seeing, the things that, that we're excited to have more and more come out into the market is SD-WAN, where we're able to bring multiple solutions together um, for customers. We're doing it in, in quite a few places, but I think as the, the one um, attendee noted, Maritime tends to lag a little bit and I'm excited to be able to get some of that stuff out and, and get Maritime more uh, aligned with some of the modern solutions. And, and Marco, what, what future services is Inmarsat looking forward to offering? Well, I, I think that uh, what I would like to see, because uh, already, you know, our, uh, the services that we are offering to, to ship owners and application providers and the platform we build are, let's say, I like to say they are future proof, but what, they, what we still struggle as, as a shipping industry is actually that, uh, uh, is to scale those efforts of digitalization. And that is where actually EMAS might make the difference. Uh, those, the, there are no standards yet. So the standards are there, but they are not enacted, they are not imposed. So every, every ship is a bespoke a large project, can take months to run that pilot that Will, Will was talking about, and even longer actually than to scale it down to, to, to the fleet. So looking to, you know, direct, looking you know, on, on uh, IMO or actually taking a, a step, uh, a, a harder step into uh, uh, and standardization of the digital and interfaces, more like uh, uh, what we see on uh, uh, 
airplanes or we have seen on cars or we have seen in other transportation industry, but that will, that will create a, a, an immense, uh, you know, a, a acceleration uh, into, for the deployment of, of, uh, of digital solutions. And Shai, uh, you're, you get the, I guess, the last word on the future. Yeah, so you're going to see, I think, ac across all the data providers, but we're pretty proud of increasing our coverage, reducing our latency, and really making this a global, uh, global consistent data set that anybody can use and actually reducing the barriers to usage. Uh, from a technology uh, perspective or in, in orbit uh, side, we're using our 100 plus satellites in order to geolocate signals on the ground. Not just pat, not just receive these uh, these signals, these AAS and ADSB. So somebody asks before it about um, uh, about uh, people violating norms, uh, communication norms. It's like, hey, we'll actually be able to respond to that and detect the signals regardless. Um, so it's super interesting where we're going. And I beat my team up over over. I don't. Uh, we talk a lot about how to make it simpler for people to use the data and how to get meaningful insights from it. So I think that's going to be the theme going forward. Well, thank you to our team of panelists. This brings us to the conclusion of this webinar. Um, there are a few remaining questions we didn't manage to answer, but they will respond to in writing and posted when the video is posted on the GVF website. Uh, you'll also be able to watch the recording of this session and of previous webinars on gvf.org. Uh, and please join us next month for our event, New Technologies, New Services, in which we will discuss the future, uh, starting with very high throughput satellites, software defined satellites, but uh, much, much more. Uh, thank you again. Thank you all.